Well, today we're going to be talking about discontinuation of non-essential medications. And uh, my name is John Swiggel, and I'm a, a pharmacist, and I practice up in Mason City, Iowa. And I'm in a family medicine residency program up there. And I also am an associate professor at the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy. And I spend, uh, well, maybe not a third of my time, but at least half a day a week uh, working with Hospice of North Iowa. And so this this particular topic is uh, really of interest to me, and I know that uh, even in my, my general practice, we always look at uh, medication use and uh, what is considered to be uh, necessary versus what is maybe not necessary, and perhaps we can discontinue uh, some of the medications that people take that, uh, that they don't need. Disclosure statement, I don't have any financial interest or relationships with any manufacturers of products uh, or providers of service, um, no relationships with companies supporting this educational event, and uh, I'm not going to discuss any pharmaceuticals uh, or devices that are investigational or unimproved for use by the FDA. So today, the objectives are, are listed here, and, and the first one is understand definitions surrounding medication use. And I think that this is important because we hear terminology, yet sometimes we, we associate a certain definition with it, and uh, we'll go through a few of those and, and provide more clear explanations as to what they are. Uh, second, define appropriate use for medications, and I, I use the term appropriate a little bit loosely because I think that is somewhat subject to interpretation about appropriate, but we'll, we'll go through some examples of that. Also identify opportunities to reduce the medication burden, and then finally uh, evaluate medication use for specific indications. So prescribing itself obviously is guided by evidence from uh, ideally randomized controlled trials, uh, however, many of those exclude the frail elderly patients, and I think most of us are aware of that, and that can be problematic, especially when we try to apply good evidence-based uh, medicine to, uh, to, to frail elderly folks. And we have guidelines, there's no doubt about that, but specific to end-of-life populations and addressing management of comorbid conditions, they just, they just don't exist, uh, which is unfortunate, and that, I think, is why we run into problems of treating people all the way up to the end of life and continuing on many medications when perhaps they just may not need to be on those meds. We all know that if you have clear harm uh, with the medication, you have to stop the medication. Aside from that, one really doesn't know the best time to stop a medication. And, and that's what we're going to kind of go through today. Hopefully I'll give you some insight on, on ways you can approach patients at least. Uh, it's not as if I'm here to promote stoppage of all these medications. If there is a, a need for a medication, I, like everyone else, would certainly advocate for continued use. So polypharmacy, this is the first term that is out there. And the definitions of it, concomitant use of multiple medications. That's sort of a, a general uh, assumption of what the definition is. Another way to look at it is administration of more medications than are clinically indicated. The problem with polypharmacy as a term is that many times providers look at it as if they have a patient that is labeled as being polypharmacy, it's suggestive then of inappropriate drug use, and that's not necessarily the case. There has been some proposed changes to terminology for polypharmacy. Uh, one is rational polypharmacy, or another way to put it is obligatory polypharmacy. And what this means basically is that if you have guideline evidence-based medicine, you are required by a certain extent to give or at least offer medications to treat those disease states. And if you have quite a few disease states, you're going to have quite a few medications. The last one, indiscriminate polypharmacy. This is suggestive then of inappropriate drug use. Uh, if you just randomly put people on medications because they want them, uh, they saw a commercial and they decide they need to have this drug, uh, things like that, that would be more indiscriminate. And I think that is where the term polypharmacy oftentimes gets, gets pigeonholed when, in fact, uh, there may be actually uh, uh, reasons to be on multiple medications and, and legitimate reasons at that. The other problem with polypharmacy is that there's no consistent cut point that defines it. Now, in nursing home settings, generally, if they're on nine or more medications, that's considered to be uh, polypharmacy. But because there's no consistent cut point, it, it's difficult to determine the prevalence uh, of, of polypharmacy. I think it's fair to say that all of us out there would say that we've seen polypharmacy. Uh, I certainly see it every day, uh, but again, it's difficult really to get a good prevalence because there's no consistent cut point. 
Another thing is a common problem found in both community dwelling uh, and also institutionalized settings. So it, it's a problem everywhere you go. And as people age, as they uh, have more disease states, clearly they're going to be on more medications. And so the polypharmacy is not limited to those who are in nursing homes, but certainly happens in the community as well. In addition, it's not limited just to prescription medications. Uh, many people take uh, herbal products, uh, vitamins and minerals, depending on the intended use of the vitamins and minerals, they may be viewed as a treatment for something. Dietary supplements are also out there, over-the-counter medications. People may not consider the periodic use of ibuprofen as a big deal. Uh, patients may not consider it that way. And then you also have some homeopathic remedies that are out there. So there's lots of things that go into polypharmacy aside from just use of prescription medications. Now, here's an assumption that we make, <clears throat> and I think we all like to live this assumption, that whatever you give somebody, they're going to take it. The adherence to regimens. Adherence is the, the, the newer term for compliance. It, I think it's a little bit less, uh, less harsh, uh, and so people like to use the term adherence. But non-adherence is an issue, especially with multiple medications. If you have regimens that were uh, either complex, or we have multiple doses per day, cost to the healthcare system, it, it, it's out there, and not adherence is a problem. Uh, and pill boxes actually are not always the answer. I know many people that do utilize pill boxes, and in some instances, yes, they, they help, but some of the newer medications that are out there cannot be placed in a pill box. And so they're, they're useful, but they're not always going to be the answer for adherence. Non-adherence. Here's an example of, of something that uh, is, is realistic. Uh, about half of the people who are given antihypertensive medications stop taking them within one year. So why is that? Well, if you give them a medication that costs $60 a month and they are completely asymptomatic with their disease state, they feel fine. So they don't quite understand why they need to continue taking a medication. And, and part of that's education. Uh, but nonetheless, if people are, are feeling fine, and they're spending money on something that doesn't make them feel any different, they may stop taking medications. It's just one reason why people do that. Non-adherence to beta blockers is about 28%, and for ACE inhibitors is 21%. So many times you'll hear about people talking about beta blockers, that the adherence rates to beta blockers is, is higher, and therefore you should use something like an ACE inhibitor or a calcium channel blocker. Perhaps they might tolerate that better. Well, the fact is non-adherence happens in both of those uh, classes of medications. And finally, non-adherence to statins uh, is estimated at 26%. So the non-adherence is out there. And, and granted, if you have medications that are known to give side effects, yeah, people may not likely uh, take those as often as they should or as, as indicated. But the fact is non-adherence happens to medications that most of us consider to be fairly benign as far as adverse events go. Factors to consider. One thing to consider is the heterogeneity of older folks. And it, it, it's greater than it is for younger patients. So the example I gave there is cardiac function. If you lined up 120-year-olds, then their cardiac function probably is going to be relatively close to, uh, to each other. But if you lined up 185-year-olds, then their cardiac function could be all across the board. Because people age at different rates, as you know. And you also have to consider multiple disease states in those individuals. Because of that, then, responses to drugs can vary considerably from one individual to the next, especially in the elderly population. What we do with that is that we, we make dosage adjustments, and uh, we start low and go slow, The whole all the geriatric uh, uh, things that you were taught. And so just keep in mind, though, that, that as people age, then they're, they're physiologic reserves and things like that can be, can be a lot dif different than if they were younger. So that makes prescribing decisions somewhat complex. Frail people, increasing number of individuals who are frail, people are living longer, they're on multiple medications. Frail people can have limited physiologic reserve, as I mentioned. They may have comorbidities that, that factor into uh, medication selection. Dysfunction with homeostasis, they can have age-related impairments with metabolism and elimination. Uh, and if you think about uh, all the pharmacokinetic aspects that can change with age and, and going from absorption to distribution, metabolism, elimination, the most important one to consider is, in fact, elimination. And that ties mainly into renal function. Uh, so medications that undergo renal elimination, those are the ones that consistently across the board 
uh, can be affected by age. Then we have drug dosing, and it tends to be standardized. Uh, we, uh, we have set doses to give for various different disease states, and if you have set doses, some people may have less than desirable effects. So if you use a standard dose of uh, whatever medication you're using to treat hypertension, for example, you might get by using that dose in a 50-year-old, but if you have a frail 85-year-old, then they may have uh, adverse effects. And again, as I mentioned, that, that adage of start low and go slow, that, that applies uh, to geriatric patients, and I think it always will. Another thing to consider is that any new symptom that a geriatric patient may have, uh, you should consider if it's drug-induced as part of the differential. Uh, drug-induced conditions can present multiple different ways, but don't ever forget to look at the list of medications and see if there's a drug in there that might be causing some of the new symptoms that, that uh, a geriatric patient may have. Standards of care. This really ties back into the polypharmacy concept. Perhaps there is a justifiable necessity for polypharmacy. In you know, an example listed down there, patient with hypertension, heart failure, and diabetes. Well, they easily can be on seven or eight or even more medications. And we do that because evidence-based medicine and guidelines tell us to. In addition to that, you have reimbursement issues. So insurance companies, if, if it's a goal-driven industry or goal-driven uh, uh, approach to care, uh, a lot of providers get paid based on how well they get to those goals or how well they meet those goals. So the insurance companies do factor into this. CMS to a certain extent as well, and even health systems. Uh, I know that our health system has uh, standards that we like to meet for uh, things like hypertension and diabetes. And those are all great and they're wonderful for the, the, the masses of people. But as people age and as they get more and more frail, you have to ask the question, is, uh, is it worthwhile for us to be as aggressive in that individual or that patient population compared to those who are 30 years younger? Goal of care for the patient. If you remember nothing else out of this presentation, this, I think, is the most important slide or at least the most important concept. The goal of care. Has it changed? Has the goal for your patient that you're dealing with on multiple medications, has the goal changed today compared to what it was five years ago? And the goal oftentimes is based on numerous things, and one of which is prognosis of the patient. When I work with residents and they want to add in a, a blood pressure medication for a nursing home individual, I will ask them, I will say, what, is, what, what goal do you want? I don't just routinely give them an answer of what medication to add. But the prognosis is very, very important because if you add a medication, will you realistically expect to, to see the benefit of that based on the prognosis of the patient? You also have to consider patient and family desires. I mean, how aggressive do, uh, th does a patient want to be treated? Uh, does the family want uh, aggressive treatment of, of the patient? Uh, risk versus benefits of the medications. As you get more aggressive in treatment of medications, you run more risks of having uh, adverse outcomes. And an example of that is uh, somebody may get syncopal because you're aggressively treating the hypertension, or they may get hypoglycemic because you're aggressively treating the diabetes. Uh, and then the expected outcomes and prevention of events. When do you anticipate seeing those? Well, those are tied into the prognosis of the patient. Is it realistic to expect benefit if the prognosis of the patient is, is, is poor? Polypharmacy, again, uh, we know it's associated with adverse drug reactions. We know the more drugs you have on board, you will have adverse drug reactions. Uh, in addition to that, you also will have drug interactions. And uh, the, the risk of drug interactions is not necessarily tied into age of the patient. The risk for drug interactions is tied into the number of medications a patient is on. Now, the reason we focus a lot in the elderly population on that is because their abilities to tolerate some of these uh, adverse effects uh, are more pronounced than it is in a younger individual. Example of that, just from an adverse effect standpoint, when you give something like amitriptyline or, or diphenhydramine to a younger individual, they probably will tolerate it a lot better than if you gave either one of those medications to a 89-year-old uh, demented individual in a nursing home. You also have to consider functional aspects, um, risk of falls, uh, cognitive impairment, how will how will multiple medications affect those? Uh, diminished functional status certainly happens as people get frail. So the last thing you want to do is give them a medication that can impair their functional status. 
And then, of course, the increased health care cost, uh, not just solely associated with medications, but health care cost from complications of using medications. And we've seen that where people come in that uh, get hospitalized because of hypoglycemia or uh, they get hospitalized because they're having a, a GI bleed and their INR on warfarin ends up being 10.4. So there's a lot of health care costs that go into it aside from just the medication standpoint. I've often... Uh, been told about Dijox and some of the docs I work with like it because it's a cheap medication. And that in fact is true. It is a cheap medication. Until you get a patient like we had a couple of weeks ago who came into the hospital and their Dij level was 2.6 and they were Dij toxic. Well, now it's no longer a cheap medication because they're hospitalized. Appropriateness of a medication, and again, I use the term appropriateness with a grain of salt because I, I realize that what's appropriate in my eyes may not be viewed as appropriate in your eyes and vice versa. The fact is that all medications have potential risks, and this is true whether you're end-of-life geriatric or if you're young and healthy. All medications have potential risks. We understand that. So the best approach to take really is try and identify those patients that might be at higher risk of problems with medications. Uh, and frailty uh, factors into this. There's an example of ibuprofen. Using ibuprofen in a 30-year-old, most of you would have no problem doing that, uh, versus using ibuprofen in an 89-year-old with numerous medical problems, such as hypertension, renal failure, and uh, heart failure. Uh, certainly, you need to think twice about using ibuprofen in that patient population. So now, I, I talk about use of medications, and, and really what we're trying to look at is how do you transition into getting rid of medications? And one thing you have to consider before you do discontinue a medication, you have to look at what the indication for that medication was. Uh, and is it in fact working for that indication? Uh, and this is true whether or not it's geriatrics end of life or not. If a medication is not doing what it is supposed to be doing or having an impact on something, don't keep giving it. It doesn't make any sense. If it's not working, why keep it on board? Another question, is there, is there an alternative to what the patient is on? Uh, perhaps a safer alternative, uh, something that might be easier to use, uh, something that might be better, it might be have, have superior efficacy. And if a medication is discontinued, what are the potential consequences? And I put down if any. Uh, many times patients make these decisions on their own. They stop taking it. If you go back to the adherence slide, they stop taking medications. Uh, so if patients don't want to take medications and they've already discontinued it on their own, then they've, they've taken care of that part of uh, uh, dealing with potential consequences. And, and sometimes you'll find that many times people will be on a whole slew of medications and they're all held and the patient all of a sudden feels better. And that ought to tell you that we sometimes use medications so much that uh, we forget about the, the underlying patient uh, quality of life aspect. Family members, they, especially in geriatrics, are often involved in decisions. You'll have sons or daughters that, that want to know what's going to happen with their mom or dad, uh, what the plan of care is, where they're going to go, and they can be involved in medication decisions. Before you stop a medication, you have to consider perceptions of the lay public. Uh, and I give an example here of a warfarin. Many times if you have AFib and you get placed on warfarin, the intent of warfarin use is indefinite. They're going to be on it indefinitely. So they may, may have heard the, the concept that you need to be on warfarin for the rest of your life. So now we go in. We say, you know what, Mr. Jones, you no longer need warfarin. Well, that might lead to the perception of giving up. And really, if there's more risk than benefit, it's, it makes sense to get rid of a drug like warfarin. But uh, all parties need to be educated, including healthcare, on this concept of we're not giving up. We're trying to simplify things reduce risks, and focus more on quality of life than we are quantity of life. Appropriate prescribing. Well, this is considered to be quality prescribing. Now, and quality is in quotations as well because, again, appropriate and quality are uh, subject to interpretation. Uh, there are some uh, values that are out there that are looked at in judging appropriateness of medications, and one of which is patient desires. Uh, now, the key thing with patient desires is very, very important. Health literacy in this state, not just this country, this state, especially in the geriatrics, health literacy is not as good as what it could be or what we think or it is or what it should be. So you will have patients that come into the clinic and they'll see the doctor or see the, uh, the provider and, and everybody says what's going on. 
And many times the patient will just nod and say, yep, I got it, I know what I'm supposed to do. And they do that because they don't know what you just told them. However, if they do understand it, you need to make sure you distinguish between those who do not understand the medical situation from those who understand the medical situation, but they disagree with your viewpoint. Their desires, the patient desires, factor into a lot of this. If they're mentally competent and able to make decisions, they have the right to make those decisions. Rationalization for the medication is another one of the, the values out there in judging appropriateness. And what this is getting at is what I talk to uh, residents every day about, and that basically focuses on why are you using the medication. And I'm not talking about you have high blood pressure or using a medication to lower the blood pressure. I mean, that's fine. I understand that. But the ultimate goal for using blood pressure medications is to prevent outcomes. And those outcomes do not happen overnight. They happen many years, sometimes down the road. The final one that they look at is the quote-unquote general good, and that's a, a mixture of things, uh, benefits to society, uh, benefits to family-related issues with prescribing, uh, all those sorts of things factor into that, that last category. Now, inappropriate <laughs> prescribing, that, that's, that's kind of a tenuous term. Uh, inappropriate has a few different subgroups underneath it, uh, one of which is under-prescribing. Underprescribing is failure to give a medication that is needed or indicated. So even though you may reduce the number of medications that somebody is on, if they have an indication for something that is not being treated, that may be viewed as inappropriate prescribing. You're not prescribing anything, but inappropriately so. Overprescribing is giving more medications than are clinically needed, and I see this a fair amount. Uh, and then misprescribing, you're given the right stuff, but you're not giving it correctly, and this may be you're giving too much of a dose, you're underdosing it, drug interactions, duplication of therapy, etc. I see a lot of misprescribing. One of the ones that comes to mind today is uh, in, in heart failure. I see a lot of people who appropriately are on things like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, but the doses of the ACE inhibitors, like lisinopril, they're at 5 milligrams a day. Well, that's not a goal dose, and so that would be underprescribing, uh, even though they have the right medication on board. General definition of inappropriate prescribing is prescribing medications that should be avoided because the potential risks outweigh the potential benefits. And uh, that's kind of tricky to figure out. But again, if you're looking at our risks of medications, you go all the way back to the slide looking at the, the frailty of the individual. And if they are a frail geriatric patient, their potential risks are probably more pronounced or certainly are more pronounced than somebody who is 30 years younger and otherwise healthy. But that's the general definition of inappropriate prescribing. There is this concept out there of what they call the medication appropriateness index. And uh, it's a good article to read. It's cited there at the bottom in Archives of Internal Medicine. Uh, it's designed to address discontinuation of otherwise indicated medications late in life. And it's motivated by the challenges of polypharmacy. The unique thing about the Medication Appropriateness Index is that this is a type of implicit criteria. And what that means is the focus of this is on the patient rather than the drug or the disease. So implicit criteria are, are certainly more useful, but they also take up more time. The Beers criteria, which is a common thing used in geriatrics, that is a type of explicit criteria. Uh, what the Beers does is they look at drug first or disease state first and then focus on the patient. So if you really want to approach this in a, a more uh, effective manner using implicit criteria where you focus on the patient and the needs of the patient, that makes more sense, but again, it does take more time. So the model for the medication appropriateness index, it, it's, it's suggested to include four items, uh, remaining life expectancy, time until benefit, goals of care, and treatment targets. And these, these form pillars, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then they also have 10 elements of prescribing that, that need to be asked when addressing medication use. And we'll talk about those after we go through the pillars here. So this is kind of a, kind of a busy slide. And I, I want to just highlight a few things as we go through this. At the bottom, the square down here, this rectangle, I guess, is appropriate medications. And so this is always going to be appropriate medications. At the top, this rectangle up here is also appropriate medications. On the far left, you see you have more time, and time just being time, uh, versus less time, looking at the fact that the patient has less time to live. On the far right, curative approach toward the bottom, 
palliative approach toward the top. And here are the four pillars that I mentioned. So remaining life expectancy, time until benefit, goals of care, and treatment target. Now what this is saying is that if your remaining life expectancy, let's say you have less time and your remaining life expectancy is somewhere up here, the time to benefit for the medication is, let's say, up here. Uh, the treatment target is up here, but your goal of care is more curative than this, this whole idea, then you're out of, uh, out of balance or out of sync. So the square or this rectangle should be somewhat equal all the way around in all four of these pillars. It doesn't make any sense to have a goal of care or uh, time to benefit. Let's say your time to benefit is going to be two years down the road, yet your remaining life expectancy is six months or less. Well, that doesn't make any sense then to have a medication where you're not going to realize the benefit of that medication because the patient will die in the meantime. So this structure is, is very useful uh, in, in trying to address what is the appropriateness of the medications that we're using. But again, it takes a ton of time, uh, patient time, and, and people don't always have that, that luxury. The 10 things that I mentioned before that are involved in medication appropriateness index, uh, if you see a little, little asterisk uh, up here and here, that is a clear indication uh, for unnecessary polypharmacy. So for example, is there an indication for the medication? If you don't have an indication for a drug, they shouldn't be on the drug. I mean, that's just plain and simple. As I say that, do not make up an indication just to keep somebody on a drug. The second one, is the medication effective for the condition? And, and again, as I said before, young old doesn't matter. If a medication is not doing what it is supposed to be doing, then you need to consider getting rid of it. Uh, I've had uh, physicians that have approached me and says, well, say, well, what do I add on to uh, this regimen for blood pressure because the first one's not doing anything? and they may be on medication at appropriate dosages uh, and I'll ask them, I'll say, so it hasn't done anything for the blood pressure and the answer is no. Well, my response to that is stop the drug and try something else. Don't add on to something if the first drug is not doing anything or the second drug is not doing anything. Is the dosage correct? Uh, underdose versus overdose. Uh, it's another thing to keep in mind. Are the directions correct? Are the directions practical? Are you giving somebody a, a medication that you expect them to take it four times a day and they're not very effective at taking something three times a day? Another one, are there clinically significant drug-drug interactions and at the same time are there clinically significant drug-disease interactions? Because if you have significant drug-drug interactions then that certainly can lead to problems about medication appropriateness. Uh, same thing with drug-disease interactions. Is there unnecessary duplication of drugs? And I, I've seen this one. Uh, you might have people that are on two steroid inhalers, which, which doesn't really make any sense. Or you might have somebody who is on um, uh, two medications that are, that are doing basically the same thing or work by the same mechanism of action. At the same time, you need to consider as an as a offshoot to that, do you have a medication on board that is doing the opposite effect of, a, of another medication? We have a patient in the hospital right now that is on uh, primatine, which is a, a medication to help increase blood pressure, yet they're also on amlodipine and metoprolol to lower blood pressure. So if you have competing medications, you need to reassess the need for the medications. Is the duration of therapy acceptable? Uh, and then finally, is the drug the most cost-effective choice? And cost-effective is something all of us keep in mind. Uh, patients realize if they're paying for a medication, the cost that they tend to see is at the pharmacy when they pick up the medication. But what we need to keep in mind is what's cost effective not just for the patient in picking up a medication, but what's cost effective for the overall health system. Limitations, as I mentioned, uh, the medication appropriateness index is a time consuming model. And you also have challenges of goal setting. Um, goals are, are something that I think are, are, are difficult to understand. Uh, patients sometimes uh, don't have uh, a good concept or of accepting what the overall goal uh, should be. And, but goal setting is something that should involve everybody, uh, not just the patient, but the families as well. And they have to be realistic goals. Um, if somebody is uh, having repeated admissions to the hospital for exacerbations of heart failure and their goal is to see their grandson graduate in five years, well, that may not be a realistic goal. But uh, certainly goal setting is part of this, and there's a challenge in, in doing that. And then finally, medication recommendations in the elderly uh, 
are limited by lack of adequate representation in clinical trials, which we've already, uh, already highlighted. So what's out there for reducing medications? Uh, there are different things that have been studied, and, and some of these, they all have, have unique twists to them or uh, things that, that they bring to the table. Uh, for example, geriatric medicine services, these can be advocated because the people who are involved in these tend to be uh, geriatricians or uh, nurses, for example, that, that specialize in geriatric care, pharmacy, dietary, that type of thing. So they understand the, the, the pathophysiology or, or the physiologic reserve of, of different patients in that, in that age group. Computerized decision support systems, I'm okay with these. Uh, they can be helpful. It, it basically will help bring questions to mind if you uh, are writing for a medication and somebody who is, is frail. Uh, they can be triggers to help remind you of, do you really want to do this or do you not? Multidisciplinary approaches, uh, those are useful as well. They may involve uh, nursing, certainly. They can involve pharmacy. They can involve uh, dietary, they can involve social workers, they can involve physicians, nurse practitioners, you name it, whatever your, your uh, group is, whatever is the most feasible for your, uh, your setting. Clinical pharmacy certainly kind of fits into those as well, and then educational approaches, and education not just to the patients and the families, but also to uh, healthcare providers uh, in the healthcare system. Ideally, if you're intervening on a medication, uh, it should be at the time of prescribing rather than retrospectively. And uh, retrospective uh, views, that's what pharmacy, at least in nursing homes, tends to do. When they go in and they do their chart reviews every month on nursing home patients, they're writing notes to the providers, and, but it's always going to be retrospective. It doesn't always work out for, for people to be there when, when, when folks do rounds and that sort of thing, but ideally, if you can intervene at the time of prescribing, that's preferred over, than, over doing it retrospectively. Uh, medication reconciliation, well, it's a driving force certainly in hospitals uh, upon admission. Uh, we are, are pushed to uh, reconcile the medication list to make sure everything is as accurate as it possibly can be. Uh, an area that's not being addressed as well, we're looking at this, as, uh, but it still has some, uh, some gaps in uh, how well we're doing it, is reconciliation upon hospital discharge. Um, the biggest breakdown, I think, when patients transition from um, ambulatory to acute, back to ambulatory, or back to an institutionalized setting like a nursing home, the biggest barrier and problem we have is lack of communication from whoever's taking care of them in the hospital to whoever's going to be taking care of them in a nursing home or back at home. We have medication changes that happen in the hospital setting. We always do. We hardly ever have somebody come into the hospital and they continue their regular medications just like they did at home. Many times in the geriatric patient population, you're tweaking something, you may be discontinuing something, you may be adding something. So there's always, it seems to be, medication changes that happen in the hospital setting. And this, this information needs to be then relayed to whoever's going to be taking care of them once they leave the hospital. And I put down some examples of dosage adjustments. Uh, GI prophylaxis, many, many times we'll have people that come in and get GI prophylaxis that do not need it. Uh, and uh, unless there's uh, somebody on a ventilator for a while or underlying coagulopathy or history of GI bleeds, the GI prophylaxis is way overused in hospitals, yet what happens is that the they, they physician or provider just transitions their inpatient meds to home meds, then they end up going home on something like uh, famotidine or pantoprazole or something like that. And then medications can be added for acute or chronic disease states. So you, can, you know that in the hospital there are changes that happen but this also needs to be related to the outpatient setting. This method, actually the brown bag approach, is useful. And the concept with this is that the, the patient puts everything they have from their medicine closet into a bag and they bring it into a clinic visit. And this includes prescription medications, even if they're not currently taking them. It includes over-the-counter products. It includes herbs and vitamins, basically anything that they're taking should be brought into the clinic visit, and then that would allow you then to see what they have. Uh, it's also an opportunity to get rid of medications that are no longer needed. Now, there are people who, if you go out and buy an antibiotic or buy something very expensive and you don't necessarily complete the course of the antibiotic or there's a change in the medication, they tend to keep them because they spent good money for them and so they don't want to get rid of them. 
So when I say opportunity to get rid of medications no longer needed, yes it is, but keep in mind that the medications, they don't belong to you, they belong to the patient. So if nothing else, get those medications out of the medicine cabinet so that there isn't confusion about what they should be taking or not taking. Now ideally, uh, it's, it's best to review medications at every visit, but that, that clearly is not a practical approach to take. Uh, my advice is if you could do this at least annually or if you have a patient who's undergoing lots of medication changes uh, more frequently than that, that would probably be uh, uh, easier to do. Avoidance of the prescribing cascade. This I think everyone's aware of and, and we fall into this. I, I admit uh, it's not necessarily an intentional thing, but uh, if we can avoid it, that'd be great. And you know what that is. Uh, just briefly, I give the example of using an NSAID which may lead to addition of a proton pump inhibitor or an increase in a diuretic dose because they have edema from the NSAID. Um, try changing the medication if you can. Uh, therapeutic holiday. This is something that's out there and, and I kind of uh, remind uh, providers about this. I say look if you stop a medication or if you suspend a medication or reduce a medication there is nothing out there that says you can't restart it. You, you can always restart something. And so one way you can get by with patients if you're trying to get rid of the non-essential medications is say, well, let's just try off, try, give you a trial off for a little bit and see how you do. And if you feel like you need it, we can always go back to it. Um, it's, it's something that we can certainly do. Coordination of care. And, and I mentioned this with transitions in, in healthcare settings. Well, coordination of care is paramount. Uh, if you have multiple disease states, you often will have multiple providers. And, and that's true in today's society. Uh, but you need to have communication among those. And so if you have good coordination of care, then that allows you to address ongoing needs and provide assessment about uh, medication needs. So coordination of care is, is just vital. Lastly, or next on the slide, is the use of two drugs for one purpose. We don't do as much of this anymore. Uh, not as common these days, but, but certainly if you can treat two or three conditions with one medication, it makes more sense to, uh, uh, to utilize that medication. Bottom line, optimal prescribing will rest on efficacy and safety. And appropriateness and cost effectiveness are a secondary thing. The focus is you want a drug that's going to be effective for whatever the intended purpose is, but it has to be safe. If it is not safe, then it doesn't make sense to use it because you run into risks of bad outcomes. And you also have to consider the likelihood of realizing the benefit as well as the goals of care. And we've addressed that already. So discontinuing medications. When do you need to do this? Well, if you are the primary care provider for that individual and you have been for a number of years, you have a relationship with that person. And so it's easier, I think, for, for that type of situation to, to stop a medication. If you are not the primary care provider, and let's say you're a consult service or they, they are sent to you for the first time, you don't want to just start slashing medications and get rid of them. Now, the exception to that is if it's providing clear harm. And I think that everyone would agree. It doesn't matter if you're end of life or not. If a medication is causing clear harm, you have to stop it. But the reason you may not want to stop right away is because you want to avoid the perception of giving up. And you don't want to lose the confidence of the patient or the family. So it, it makes sense to form that relationship. If you have it, it's easier to do this. If you don't have it, give it time. And then at some point, we can start uh, reducing medications. Assess the needs and clarify with the patient and the family. What are the needs? What are the goals of the patient or the, uh, or the family members for the patient? And are we meeting those needs with the medications that we're using? And one thing I've, I've run into, and I don't know, I assume that you have too, I rarely meet people who feel like they're uh, not taking enough drugs, that they want more drugs to take. It's quite common for especially geriatric folks or family members to feel like they're taking so many medications. Uh, when I worked in retail pharmacy, I'd have people come in and they feel like they own stock in the pharmacy with the number of medications that they're taking. So if you could ask them, say, do you feel like you're taking too many medications? And if they say yes, then that opens the door for you. And you can say, okay, well, what do you think about looking at your medication list and maybe minimizing some of these medications so you don't have to take as many? And many times that will work. Patients will, will jump on board with that idea. The primary intent of the medication is, is important in determining the continuation. So is the intent for primary prevention or is the intent for secondary prevention or tertiary prevention? Uh, 
And this again ties into the goals of therapy uh, and have those goals changed today compared to what they were five years ago. Will continu discontinuation of the medication affect the functionality? Uh, if the answer is yes, then you might want to continue with the medication. If the answer is no, then it makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to stop a medication. Patient perceptions. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, many patients, they, they continue to take treatments which really don't help them, but they also don't hurt them, like vitamins and minerals. And part of this is that it provides a means for patients to have some control. So they get diagnosed with these disease states, multiple disease states. They might be end of life, and they just feel like they have no control over anything. Well, if they want to take a multivitamin because they've done that for the past 50 years and they feel better by taking it, I'm absolutely fine with that. Um, patients may wish to continue the status quo. I've always done it this way, and I'd like to keep doing it this way if I can. My neighbor has uh, non-small cell lung cancer and uh, is in end-of-life care right now, and uh, the neighbor is taking uh, basal insulin at night. Doesn't matter if he takes the basal insulin or not as far as his prognosis, but he's always done that, and so he wants to continue doing that. And that is maintaining the status quo. Some may be relieved by a decreased burden of taking medications, and uh, like I said before, there are very few times where people feel like, hey, I, I need more medications. Come on, give me more medications because I want to take more. No, it's usually the opposite. <clears throat> they take, feel like they take too many medications as it is, so if we decrease this pill burden, then many people jump on board with that. And then risk versus benefit. If the risk outweighs the benefit, no reason to continue it. There is a, a, a way to look at the medication appropriateness index, and, and rather than looking at time to benefit, look at it as, as time to harm. So it, it's the same concept as number needed to treat and number needed to harm. So you always consider the risks versus the benefit of medications. Now, the other thing is, and, and this is <clears throat> something that I see, if you stop a medication, if it's agreed upon that you're going to stop a medication, we'll stop monitoring for that disease state. So I gave examples down here. Diabetes and blood glucose. If it's agreed upon in a type 2 diabetic at end of life that, you know what, let's just stop giving you the medications for your diabetes because uh, it's not really going to have any bearing on, on the outcomes that happen. Well, if you stop doing that, stop checking blood glucose because invariably what happens is you're going to get high numbers and then they're going to say, oh, should we restart these medications? So if you stop a medication, stop the monitoring that goes along with that medication. Because oftentimes, if you obtain a result, you're obligated to do something with it. You can do nothing with it, but nonetheless, you might feel pressure from others to do something or act upon it. And all caregivers and family members need to be on board with this. So how do you stop medications? Well, you can abruptly discontinue it, which has been done. Uh, may not be wise for all medications. I give examples of a couple of them that you don't want to abruptly stop. Uh, because of uh, withdrawal symptoms, but if, on the other hand, if there's clear harm, you have to stop them. So even if it's clonidine, well, if they have a systolic pressure of 75 and they're getting syncopal, you can't take the time to taper down on it. The second approach is tapering medications, and, and that's uh, another thing you can do. So let's say that they're on um, a medication they're taking three times a day. Well, what if we decide just to give it to you two times a day and, and slowly taper down on the medication? And then there's selective withdrawal. So looking at that medication list, pick out high-risk medications, medications that are known uh, to have potential complications that are uh, warranted as a high-risk medication, and start with those. Look at medications that are not likely to provide the benefit. So I mentioned if you have, let's say, aspirin for primary prevention. Well, if prognosis is poor enough, then you might run into more risk with the aspirin than you are likely to see uh, the benefit of it. And then medications that are difficult to take, it makes sense to get rid of those as well. And that could be uh, pills that are either too big to swallow, uh, it could be uh, numerous doses per day, uh, things that people uh, don't want to take. And, and again, they may have already stopped taking these, so it makes sense to uh, just to, to stop them or withdraw them from the regimen. Okay, specific populations, we'll talk about that here for a little bit. Uh, interestingly enough, there's very little data out there on stopping medications. Advanced dementia is one area that they have looked at and where the evidence is on when can you stop these, some of these medications in a de uh, demented individual. The first up is basically the cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, limited evidence on when to discontinue them. And some evidence does exist uh, that notes worsening behaviors after denepazole was discontinued. And, and I've seen that in patients. And so what we do in that instance is uh, 
we just restart the denepazil and, and then it takes care of the, uh, the behaviors. The key thing in advanced dementia with the cholinesterase inhibitors focuses on the slowing of decline. They do not prevent uh, the disease from uh, declining. It will decline or it will continue to progress. These drugs are just designed to slow that uh, disease progression. If, if the slowing of the decline is no longer the goal or if quality of life is poor, it doesn't make any sense to continue with cholinesterase inhibitors. It's no longer appropriate. And they mentioned, and this is where the evidence comes in, cautious discontinuation is recommended. Well, in, in my view, if, if the goal is, is no longer uh, to prolong uh, or slow down the decline of the disease state, you can just stop it. Memantine, same way, or Namenda, uh, limited data suggestion is to discontinue in advanced dementia. They did look at statins specifically in advanced dementia, and again, this is one that, that probably is a little bit easier to stop because the benefits from statins are really only realized after a period of months to years. And in the absence of a recent stroke, in the absence of recent acute coronary syndrome, it makes sense to discontinue uh, statins in those with advanced dementia. And I would argue even in those uh, patients with uh, end of life that don't have advanced dementia, statins are a, a class of medications that are, are fairly easy to stop. Antimicrobials, this gets into the aggressiveness of treatment and uh, how aggressive you want to treat someone is going to be determined mainly by uh, advanced care planning. And so give consideration at least in advanced dementia patients to uh, withholding antibacterial therapy and providing symptomatic relief as they get toward end of life. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to be aggressive with antimicrobials uh, in advanced dementia. And so those are, the, those are the meds in advanced dementia that have evidence. Uh, they also looked at uh, other medications, which they say is, is driven uh, by opinion rather than evidence. And I certainly think that opinion uh, in this adventure is, is out there. Diabetes medications. Uh, there's consensus that type 2 diabetics uh, medications are not life-sustaining and the risk for DKA is low, uh, if, if even apparent. Um, uh, the key factor, though, is oral intake, and this is true, I think, in non-demented people at end of life. Uh, if the oral intake declines, you have to be very careful with the oral hypoglycemic agents, and, and ideally those should probably be withdrawn. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about which ones here in just a bit. Antihypertensives, it's noted that uh, if, if people have cachexia-associated weight loss, that could allow for cessation of antihypertensive therapy. Probably more likely what's going to lead to it is if you have low blood pressures. And, and we see this a fair amount uh, that uh, people, as they get toward the end of life, their blood pressures may or not, may not necessarily be, uh, be high. As a matter of fact, they could be low. And so we start pulling back on antihypertensives. Uh, anticoagulants, um, in advanced dementia at least, uh, those with impaired nutritional intake or who require frequent alterations in medications, those folks are at high risk for poor outcomes. I think you can take that statement and you can pull it out of just the advanced dementia patient population. Clearly, if you have nutritional intake that fluctuates and you're on warfarin, and if you have frequent alterations in the dose and that sort of thing, uh, you have to question the benefit of the drug versus the risk that you're running with bleeds. And there's limited data on antiplatelet agents, but nonetheless, uh, we tend to, uh, to stop those uh, as well. And finally, uh, medications for osteoporosis, really little evidence for effectiveness of vitamin D or calcium, and especially if they're immobile in advanced dementia patients. And oftentimes, uh, calcium is a fairly big pill unless you use the chewable forms like Tums uh, or Viactive. But nonetheless, uh, if you use tablet formulations of calcium, vitamin D, they're fairly big pills. And you have to question the effectiveness of using them. But again, if you have a patient outside of dementia, if you have a patient who feels like they want to take that for their own well-being, I'm okay with it. Bisphosphonates, uh, these may actually be contraindicated in advanced dementia because if you cannot take them, if the patient cannot take them as instructed, they can't sit up for the 30 minutes, they can't because of pain, for example, it makes sense to stop the medication. And again, the larger question is, will the patient see the benefit from uh, something like bisphosphonates? Uh, stopping this class of medications is, is a fairly easy thing to do because the bisphosphonates become incorporated into the bone and the half-life of the drug essentially becomes the half-life of the bone. And this is true in not just demented people, but also uh, other patient populations as well. Okay, medication-specific. Key question again, risk versus benefit. Um, current goals of therapy, and, and again, often the goals of therapy will not align with the guidelines because the guidelines focus on set numbers. 
And if you have a diabetic patient, depending on what guidelines you believe, if you want an A1C of 7 or 6.5%, um, I'm going to sit here and tell you that if you have an 89-year-old demented person, um, I don't see a reason to go down that low for A1Cs. Keep them a little high because you want to avoid risks of hypoglycemia, at least in that instance. And again, will the benefit be realized given the prognosis of the patient? Uh, is the medication for prevention or is it for active treatment? So those are questions that, that certainly need to be asked for every single medication. So warfarin, a high alert medication, I don't mean to pick on warfarin, certainly we've used our fair share of it. Uh, key aspects, indication for use and dietary intake as I mentioned earlier. And again, if your INRs fluctuate or you have frequent monitoring, discontinue warfarin. And if you're wondering if uh, drugs like uh, uh, rivaroxaban or uh, dabigatran or maybe apixaban if it ever makes it on the market, if you're wondering if those are better alternatives, the answer is no, they are not. Diabetes medications, okay, here we go with, with the ones that I'm concerned about. Insulin regimens, uh, clearly we use insulin quite a bit. Uh, your goal is to avoid hypoglycemia, and I put down basal bolus with a question mark. I have seen people in our hospice program on basal bolus insulin, and uh, they're type 2 diabetics, and, and I ask the question of why. Because you, you need to figure out what's the intent of that. Uh, the intent is, uh, in my view, is just to, to, to pull back a little bit and keep them from having uh, symptoms of hyperglycemia. But the more aggressive you get with things like basal bolus insulin, the higher the risk you run for hypoglycemia. And sulfonylureas are a drug class that I try to stop if I can in, in frail elderly people, especially if they stop eating. Sulfonylureas have the potential for prolonged hypoglycemia. And so you have to be very careful about use of these agents in those that uh, uh, do not have adequate um, uh, nutritional intake on a consistent basis. The rest of the diabetes medications, again, no need to be aggressive in end-of-life care. Keep them, uh, don't necessarily go toward the goals of, of A1C, uh, but keep them asymptomatic and, and just be realistic with what the needs are. Urinary incontinence medications, you know, surprisingly, the, the, the evidence-based medicine in advanced dementia did not talk about these. But it's particularly true. I, I have issues, and, and this is what I mean with using a drug uh, that might be uh, not accepted or, or not tolerated in demented people because of the, the underlying pathology. But they antagonize muscarinic receptors, and it makes no sense to give an anticholinergic medication uh, to a person with, with advanced dementia, for example, because it certainly can lead to behaviors. Uh, aside from that, the efficacy of the, the urinary incontinence medications is marginal at best. So your efficacy is not there, your risk for adverse effects is, it doesn't make sense to use these medications and regular toileting is preferred. If that's not feasible, uh, then you have to uh, consider other alternatives. But, but I will caution you that using anticholinergics and not just the urinary incontinence medications, but drugs that have strong anticholinergic properties, using those in demented people will get you into trouble. Statins, again, what's the intent? Uh, the benefit's not likely to be realized for months to uh, years, and so in general, end-of-life care, it makes sense to, to not give statins. Uh, if they just had acute coronary syndrome uh, event and, and they're older, yes, I can understand that, but if the prevention is you're focusing more on cholesterol and trying to get LDL goals down and that sort of thing, then uh, you might consider uh, withholding these medications. Antihypertensives, we've already talked about these. The, the last thing that you want to do is put somebody at increased risk for falls. So I think part of that is objectively with uh, measuring blood pressures and, and seeing where they're at. And certainly it's advocated, especially in frail elderly, uh, make sure you get standing blood pressures in these people uh, because you know their, their uh, blood pressure taken in the clinic may be fine, but you stand them up and it may drop. So uh, certainly make sure you don't put, put them at increased risk for falls with antihypertensives. Antiplatelet medications, well, this includes uh, just a few of them listed here, aspirin, clopidogrel, and uh, prazogrel. And again, what's the intended purpose uh, versus the risk of adverse effects, namely bleeds? Um, if you have somebody who just got a stent put in, well, they're going to be on these medications because of the uh, risk for rethrombosis, uh, uh, stent thrombosis. But nonetheless, if they're there mainly for prevention, uh, preventative means, uh, then you have to question the benefit of them. Uh, drugs like aspirin in particular, the adverse effects are dose-related, so if you are using aspirin, use the lowest dose possible, uh, typically 81 milligrams per day. But again, if you have a stent, it might be a little bit different. 
So conclusions, medication uh, regimens must be individualized, and, and I cannot stress that enough. Getting back to the medication appropriateness index, you, you want the implicit criteria. Focus patient first, focus on, on, on goals of care, uh, and, and, and tie the medications into that individual. Uh, goals of care, as I mentioned, when will these be realized? And, and this, again, is based on prognosis of the patient. So you have to consider the prognosis of the patient, uh, which can be difficult at times, I understand that. But if they're frail, if they're, they're, their focus is uh, not so much curative, not so much life prolonging, then you can look at medication regimens that are simplified a little bit more. And then education and communication are key elements uh, to appropriate medication use. So uh, make sure that whatever you're deciding to do and uh, working with your, your, your colleagues in different areas, and education not just to uh, patients and families, but also, again, to uh, the, the folks that uh, help care for the patients with you. So with that, uh, we are completed, and uh, thank you for your attention, and that's all I have. Thanks.